Hello, everybody. It looks like we are live. Um, let's get going. Hello, uh, everybody. Thank you for being here, and thank you for your time. Uh, I do have my able colleague, uh, Bill Wilmot, with me. He's just going to drop a friend off, uh, and he'll be back. Bill will uh, engage with you on uh, the uh, chat group if there are any uh, significant questions that come up then Bill will be able to ask those questions on your behalf towards the end of this. You know, I'll be honest with you, there's uh, such a lot of content to share that I've had to scale back everything I was going to cover. And now I could cut out a lot of the stuff and get straight to the point. But if I then start sounding technical, then that may defeat the purpose. The idea of this Hangout uh, for you um, yeah, is that you're able to share this with just about anybody. So when people are asking questions like, well, what is all this going on? It just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, hopefully, my method will be a little bit, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, watered down uh, so that you are able to convey the message to whoever is interested in understanding about uh, uh, what's going on with Bitcoin. But you know, first and foremost, we are here in this space because we want to make money from Bitcoin and the activities surrounded, uh, surrounding Bitcoin. That's the, that's the key element. Um, uh, I'm quite confident that the vast majority of uh, viewers and even otherwise uh, generally in the public, uh, people are not interested in Bitcoin because of its technical aspect. So when people join Bitcoin or Bitcoin-related opportunities, it's very nice and lucrative and you feel like you're making money and it's almost like a real-life uh, computer game that's somehow giving you, churning money on a little handheld mobile device or something, you know? But uh, then come these kind of segregated witness uh, and uh, fork, hard fork, soft fork-related discussions and everybody's like, what is this? I signed up to make money and all of a sudden things are not working out. So I do believe a little bit of explanation might uh, take this further. Uh, without wasting more, more of your time on that, let me just go straight into the presentation. Uh, Mr. Wilmot is back. So Bill, if you don't mind uh, unmuting and confirming when you see the screen. <clears throat> can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Bill. So, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> uh, Bitcoin uncertainty, this is especially prominent in this region now uh, between the end of uh, June and uh, all of July so far and leading into the early part of August. So it's clear there's a lot of uncertainty and we're going to try and tackle this as best as we can. Before we go there, a lot of people were saying, oh, buy on the dip. Right, so this is a little graphic I borrowed from uh, one of my Facebook contacts, uh, Trader Travis. And there you go. You know, have you found the bottom? Do you know where the dip is? Did you know when it was going to turn around? Do you know if it can go back down? Because there's no amount of charting anyone can do if there are other uh, uh, factors that impact the price of Bitcoin. So anyone that says, don't bother mining, or don't bother with it unless you are able to buy at a dip. They need to be able to tell you when a dip is. And unless they take responsibility for calling you and saying, this is the dip, buy now, um, it's not worth paying attention to them. Otherwise, you will end up thinking and becoming a trader, which I know for a fact the vast majority of people I know are not ideally trading minded. It is an acquired taste. And once you get this taste, it takes over your life. Uh, and it's not necessarily uh, always profitable. Most traders actually lose money. Uh, they just don't admit it. And this is why I find all these chart experts uh, slightly, occasionally slightly hypocritical. But going forward, <clears throat> this is the problem. It's all been about fear. And if I'm very honest with you, you know, uh, the fear is what I picked up from all the various social media discussions. The price of Bitcoin was down. The market cap was significantly down. Mining returns are lower. They're also down. And every single visible number that should be good is now suddenly a bad number. So the mining difficulty rate was relatively low. It suddenly jumped up. So that's a bad number. It wasn't necessarily down, but its profitability was down. 
So there's a lot of this coming from other people's comments on social media that make it worse. It, it confuses you, right? It confused me because I'm like, is he, is he saying this because he actually knows what he's talking about? Or is he just, he or she, are they just expressing their innermost concerns and fears uh, without any restraint? Now, my lovely people, you know this very well. I'm a visible and transparent on Facebook anyway. Look at any of my posts over the last few weeks. Did you ever hear even a little peep of panic or fear-mongering about the Bitcoin price or about Bitcoin mining specifically? Yes, about the state of finance and banking, yes. That is a reality that people need to be woken up to and you need to shout it from the rooftops. But on the other hand, did you, did you se sense at all any panic in me? And I, I doubt it very much because I never panicked about this. Why? Because, you know, if you understand the fundamentals which we're going to cover in this hangout, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> oh, I need, I need more hay fever medication, really. Um, uh, you know, if, if, if we're going to cover all this, how so many experts are born overnight and then they start posting things and that drives fear into other people. They read it and they absorb the fear and then they report it on your timeline saying, but this, but that and the other. And then you start thinking, well, yeah, actually, you know what? This isn't looking very good, is it? All of a sudden, you know, the sky might fall and what have you. And, you know, and the critics who've been saying, look, we told you it's nonsense. You know, the critics become more vocal. So the response to all of this is very simple. Let us study and investigate. But I appreciate that many of you may not have the time to do that. So this is why I have decided to do a systematic study of this in order to help you get along better. But out of your own concerns and in your own way of preparing, many of you have already taken action, which is great. Um, but we're going to sort of uh, wrap this up in a way that you are able to convey it to others without having to necessarily repeat it every single time. This video is all yours, uh, especially if you're a member with us. Download it, rip it, do whatever you want with it. It's all yours. You have my full permission right here. OK? Now, <clears throat> I mean, the days of Windows, uh, I now use Apple, thankfully. I'm never going back to Windows. But when you had Windows 95, uh, when the next one came out, everybody wanted to upgrade around, uh, you know, the millennium bug uh, thing. They were saying, we've got a better version. You need to buy another software package. It's faster, better, whatever. And then after that, you had to buy another one. And then after that, you had to buy another one. Do you know something? You've been forking your own devices all your life, especially if there's software concerned. A software upgrade from one version to another version is a fork. You never called it that. You just called it an upgrade, right? Why would you call it a fork? Because you're not a techie. You're not a computer person. You know, you're not the person you call in the IT desk to help you out. You, 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 you are you, and you call it a simple software upgrade. So what's the difference then between a hard fork and a soft fork? Very simple. Hard fork is where you have to uninstall one version to install the next version, then you uninstall and install the next version. Basically you lose the previous version, right? So when you've installed the upgraded version, you lose the previous one. Whereas, like if you have an Android phone or an Apple phone and some of your operating system gets an automatic update every few months and then you click to accept and then read the terms and accept and then let it plugged in and it just updates overnight on its own, that's a soft uh, fork. It's as simple as that. <clears throat> the wording, is absolutely nothing ever to be nervous or you know confused about. It's a very straightforward differentiation between the two. Now, uh, a, a soft fork is usually where you just agree, install, and it's done. It, it just uh, sits as another layer on top of your previous platform. It's an improvement to the previous platform, no doubt, um, but it is still integrally connected to the previous uh, platform, whereas, in the hard fork, the next upgrade that you install may be, uh, have some fundamental differences which will reject the previous version. If it rejects the previous version completely, the previous version sitting around using 
desk, disk space on your computer is of no, no uh, use at all. When a hard fork occurs, all the computers connected to that network that wishes to be part of that network, you have to mandatorily therefore upgrade because you don't have a choice. There may be uh, parts of your computer that just will not talk to the network. Uh, so if you wanted to talk to the network, you have to remove what you have and install the new thing. That's a hard fork. The soft fork is voluntary, so you could do it, you know, and it is done uh, on the fly. Both adjusting and, and installing is done on the fly. So installment is basically, uh, you know, a small group of people do it on day one, a few others next week, a few others a week later, as and when time permits. So, you know, it's a gradual process. Eventually, everybody has an upgraded version because otherwise they lose out on the benefits and functionality. Um, in case of the hard fork, if you don't use this installation, if you don't use this version, you don't have access to it. So you lose it. Basically, you lose connectivity to the new network uh, that you've uh, established. Whereas uh, uh, in the soft fork, if there are any bug fixes or anything else, you know, you can still adjust it on the fly, as in uh, if something is realized a little bit later saying, oh, uh, that the version upgrade was successful, but there's still a problem, so another little patch or software can be added to it. It's sent to you, and you just have to click and accept, and it's done, right? Um, hard fork, you can't go back to the old version. In soft fork, you can go back to the old version. You can reject the soft fork and go back and stay basic, and thereby lose a few functions. But you can still prefer to use the old version. Now, uh, Windows users will tell you that some of these older versions were better than some of the latter versions because the latter versions were far too buggy. They never really fixed the bottom line problems of Windows. Um, uh, so, you know, anyway, uh, hard fork is permanently uh, 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 fixed, whereas a soft fork is basically when everybody is gradually brought up to speed to the network, it essentially becomes as good as a hard fork eventually, right? Because eventually, so many upgrades later, you are miles ahead of the old version you had in 95. Uh, and you have, everybody has a Vista now, and the Vistas talk to each other. So basically, a hard fork uh, uh, is what res uh, uh, ends up looking like when you do a series of soft forks. <clears throat> Whereas the hard fork itself is just uh, a permanent installation. If you wanted to then upgrade it, even a hard fork can be <laughs> soft fork later by gradual upgrades. But a hard fork is uh, usually replaced by yet another hard fork. So it's, it's uh, 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 a significant bifurcation uh, uh, away from the original. I hope all that makes sense. If not, you know, I'd, I'd, uh, let me know, and uh, we can try and uh, uh, do another Hangout to cover some of this if necessary. But I'll be very honest with you. If you're interested in where Bitcoin is going and how it's uh, looking health-wise, you don't really need to you know, check its pulse and know the inner workings of the Bitcoin itself, to be honest with you. Um, but we're going to deal with this because this is what's on people's minds, and they need to know, at least have a grasp of what's going on. So um, to explain the blockchain, uh, you know, um, I thought I'll use a uh, slushy uh, 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 meter. So if you had <coughs> Mr. Rapu from uh, uh, Quickie Mart in Springfield, uh, you know, he would love to have a lot of people come to his Quickie Mart and buy slushies. But um, wouldn't it be nice if he could literally connect a pipeline to all the individual homes all across Springfield and without him having to even pay attention to it, um, if they could just pump the slushy respectively towards them? then what you essentially have is the version of a blockchain. The more people you have connection to, the greater will be the capitalization. So more and more the network grows, more and more people that come in, the more and more you will see uh, the value uh, and the money coming into Bitcoin. And uh, that's why it is necessary to have a lot of people involved. Bitcoin has reached its price recently only because there are significantly more people involved than ever, ever before. Okay, but at the same time, each of these, uh, the blockchain also has another function. It, it uh, acts as a pressure meter reading uh, uh, in this case. 
uh, which is signified here by this little clock face. Um, so what does that do? Well, basically, a blockchain is an open ledger accounting system. What does that mean? It sounds very complicated. But what it, it, all it is is if Mr. Burns or somebody else in, the, in Springfield was to uh, order a few slushies, um, you know, everybody on the network gets to see it all at the same time, right? So everybody knows who's consumed how many, and everybody knows who's sent back how many. Yeah, so that's the idea of the blockchain. That is what is open ledger accounting. That's why practically each of these connections has its own set of meters, and everybody knows. Now, if everybody knows what is going on, and the whole world is able to verify, let's say in this case, all of Springfield is able to verify, um, you know, that the transaction did actually take place, and it is all clearly visible on the blockchain, then what is better, uh, one eyewitness or two eyewitnesses? If an incident takes place and the police asks how many witnesses are there, if five people confirm they all saw exactly the same thing, five people's uh, testimony is stronger than the testimony of just one person. Uh, if it applies in court, it also applies in accounting. And therefore, the more the connections, the more the connectivity into the blockchain, the greater is the security of Bitcoin. The greater is your assurance that you know that the transaction you sent or received is indeed authentic. That's the simple logic by which blockchain has had all the banks scratching their heads. Because uh, banks don't offer any of this. If you put money into your bank and from there you transfer it to your brother, and from your brother you send it to, so he sends it to somebody else, only the banks and the banking system know about it. The rest of the world doesn't even have a clue. With the blockchain, anybody from anywhere in the world, if provided you know the date, the time, and the account number, the, the long Bitcoin wallet number, you can look it up on the blockchain yourself. Was this payment actually made? Yes, it was. Okay. <coughs> so what's a node? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, basically, before we get to the node, a number of these slushies <laughs> would represent a block. Now, this is obviously not exactly the number of uh, Bitcoin in each block, but a number of Bitcoin put together is one block. So when you do the Bitcoin mining calculator, uh, it usually says next difficulty retarget occurs at block number whatever. This is the block prior to this is currently being mined. The next block is now due in eight or something days. I put this together maybe two years, two days ago. So. Uh, now eight days remaining to this block number such and such to be uh, 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 coming into the blockchain. Okay, so first of all, that is a block, and a whole block of them, not just one slushy at a time, but a whole block of slushies going through the blockchain, mining results, which is the uh, Bitcoin generated in the mining operation coming into the pipeline. It goes in there, the nodes are the ones that confirm the transaction. Now, not everybody has a node. You can have a node. You can download a node and a master node. So basically, some of these will be nodes and some of these will not be nodes. Yours is most definitely not going to be a node. If it is a node, then you are probably wasting your time listening to uh, a novice like me. You probably already know way more than me. So I, I, you, know, uh, you, you can probably pick holes in my explanation. But if you have a node, that simply means it's and a node isn't a different machine or some kind of a monster sitting somewhere. It's the same laptop, same computer that you and I use on a daily basis, except you have to download something extra. And that extra is a piece of software uh, which performs a few additional functions. One of them is to verify. And the verification is what makes each Bitcoin authentic, just like uh, when you take a banknote to a bank teller, they match it against ultraviolet light. They may hold it up and look uh, 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 look at the light through it. And they may try and check the paper quality and the print quality. They might look for a thin metallic strip. They may look for a number of things to verify. And then they might say, okay, this is genuine. If not, they'll say, sorry, can't take this. This is, or, you know, I'll report you or whatever if it's fake. So that's the same logic here if you had somebody instead of a bank teller doing the job 
But what if you could have hundreds and hundreds of people doing the verification of each block of block uh, of uh, <coughs> Bitcoin being mined? What if you could have hundreds of people doing that job? They are basically verifying the authenticity of uh, uh, the, the Bitcoin itself. When it's verified, it remains on the blockchain, but basically mining product goes in. It gets verified by a computer, just like yours and mine, which is connected to the internet, which is then where the blockchain actually resides. So it's nothing but digital connectivity, just like your regular computer network. And a verified Bitcoin comes out. And the verified Bitcoin then is basically when it's verified, the miners get a reward. Um, and a piece of that reward is the return upon which our business model is built. So when verified, what comes out of the other end is basically uh, contains a small few droplets of that each slushy that we get to then call our returns on our mining power that we purchased. Okay, uh, but all of this takes place on the blockchain. Now, uh, once it gets verified through here, it has a few destinations. It either can be stored in an online wallet, you can put it into your hard wallet. Many of you already have this. Or you can put it on an exchange. Uh, there's really not much else you can do with uh, a Bitcoin at this point. Um, you wouldn't want to do anything else. You know, you want to keep it safe in one of the types of wallets or on an exchange to maybe speculate a little bit. And the idea of a node is that this is the more critical function of the distributed open ledger, which gives a uh, Bitcoin its advantage. Bitcoin has so many superior advantages to regular fiat printed paper currency that this is the reason why governments and banks and large institutions are taking an interest in it because it has proven to them that their fraud is, is running out of excuses, uh, which is basically, you know, the banks got to do whatever they wanted to do. Here, it is a people power driven system created by somebody who doesn't even want to reveal his real name. And he could have easily set up a company to say Satoshi and Satoshi Limited. And he could have created an empire out of Bitcoin. But he doesn't even want you to know who he is because he's done it so that people can take it forward. You and I can take it forward. Even in our limited knowledge, you and I can take this currency forward. And it doesn't have to rely on an organization that is mainly interested in your taxes and bombing other people in far off countries. So part two of the node, we've just figured out what the block does. So from the Slushy machine comes a series of Bitcoins. A number of them put together is a block. What do you do with this? Well, to begin with, mining new blocks is the greatest activity you can do. Why? Because that's where the rewards are. It's juicy. It's, you know, that's where you make a bit of money. You know, somebody else is buying the slushy and you're still getting a few droplets here and there. And if you collect enough drops, you've got the whole slushy for yourself, you know, uh, whoopie do. And then <coughs> obviously the next thing that follows is because there are other coins now available, more and more people want to do trading. So the primary traffic in the blockchain comes through the mining for sake of confirmation of each uh, new block. So that is great. But then comes trading volume. Because people want to buy and sell and buy and sell and buy and sell. And each time you're moving money in and out, in and out, in and out, a blockchain transaction takes place. And in that blockchain transaction, not within the exchange, but external to the exchange, when a blockchain transaction takes place, something happens. There is an increased traffic inside the blockchain. And then comes retail acceptance. Now imagine if every uh, uh, store in every part of the world was to accept blockchain a uh, bitcoin as a payment um, that would be hundreds and hundreds of millions of transactions uh, every second and could the blockchain handle it no because there is a limited width to this pipeline and that's where blockchain's uh, main achilles heel is this is the blockchain achilles heel not bitcoin's problem the slushy machine will produce whatever slushy, <laughs> however many units you add on to them, right? But it's the blockchain that is not able to cope with the increased traffic. So then there is a congestion overload, and then 
transactions start being uh, slower, hence they become limited uh, uh, in the speed and the efficiency. You know, before you could say within nanoseconds I can transfer money from this part of the world to that part of the world. Now it can take five, six, seven hours to confirm. Some people even report 24 hours to confirm the money is actually uh, being transacted. And obviously, confirmation costs go up. Why? Because it becomes more and more expensive to even confirm this, right? But we'll touch on this in a moment uh, anyway. So this is the small example I wanted to give you. Uh, our friendly neighbors, the French, they have a, a habit of going on strike every now and then. Uh, so on a Monday, they decide to find an excuse to go on strike, and the rest of the week, they go on strike. And that causes a big headache for the truckers leaving England towards uh, uh, the port cities of uh, Dover uh, in, in the UK. So Kent Police, where Dover is located, Kent Police have come up with uh, a, a way of dealing with this. The French strike so often that um, the Kent Police have a proper name for this operation. It's called Operation Stack. And <clears throat> what they do is they organize these trucks in a certain way. Uh, for a stretch of the motorway, cars and other traffic is allowed to pass, but the truckers have to just park and literally overnight stay in their own cabins. They're usually all equipped to do that anyway. But operation stack means no going further, and, uh, uh, and yet the traffic flows. Now, this other picture is my hometown of Pune in India. And this is a good day in uh, Pune. On a bad day, it's much worse than this traffic situation. Now, this is what I wanted to discuss. Both sides are individuals. They're not robots. They, 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 they each can think on their own and independently, and they don't have to be told what to do. And yet, there are two different behavior patterns that come out of this. Both use the exact same infrastructure, the same blockchain, which in this case is the road network. They use the same type of internal combustion engines and the same type of fuel, petrol, diesel, whatever. Both get tired with this kind of uh, a traffic situation. And both are grossly inconvenienced. Both sides lose money, time, and opportunity. You could be doing something much better with your time. You could be making a record-breaking painting in the luxury of your uh, studio at home instead of, you know, uh, stacking your vehicle in traffic. And uh, it is a loss of time and money as well. You know, it's uh, both are precious. But why is it that it is like this? And, you know, I don't want to go too deep into the philosophical part of it. But I just want to explain the blockchain. So, you know, uh, one side has a law mindset. I was always taught in India that a lot of things that are wrong with our country are because of the British. The British get blamed for absolutely everything. Then I came to Britain, and I found none of that uh, to be true. Uh, you know, we, we are told that we are, you know, there's so much corruption because the British made us poor, and poverty leads to corruption. Nonsense. You know, I know exactly how the mindset of my own people works, and they're intrinsically corrupt. It's got nothing to do with the British. They were corrupt thousands of years before the British even came. So, you know, <laughs> this is why I've put down here, uh, law mindset is, you know, there is chaos in the world. Let's bring some order to it. Let's enact some laws that restrict people. And there are severe penalties for breaking those laws. Whereas here, it's a karma mindset. You know, well, as long as I get forward, who cares about you? If you left, get left behind, that's your bad karma. If I am able to take advantage of the situation and go ahead of you, that's my good karma. I had opportunity. I took full advantage of it. What do I care about you? And this is the mindset that comes out of karma, which is why, you know, karma, you take a, a person from my home city and put them in English traffic, there will be a liability on the road and a danger to other road users. On the other hand, you take a reasonably law-abiding person and put them into a chaotic traffic situation and their life will be at risk because they will not know how to exactly negotiate unless they're really, really <laughs> quick learner. Uh, they, they will find it impossible to drive or even survive in this environment. So anyway, uh, the reason I wanted to explain this is to get it to a point called congestion. And this is what happens. Congestion costs either nerves, patience, but most importantly, money. You can wait a little longer. If confirmation takes you six hours instead of six seconds, you will probably be willing to wait. 
but you will not find it tolerable if it's also going to cost you money. So here's a transaction for about $50 worth of money, uh, uh, Bitcoin being moved only recently. $5 is the fee. Before, it was next to zero. It was $0.02, dollars, two cents uh, just last year. Two cents to make a $50 payment. Now $5 to make a $50 payment, <clears throat> or $4.96 in this case. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it is not acceptable. And this is the reason why we need to find a solution to get rid of this congestion. Now, we know that the blockchain, and as represented in the pipeline, has its limitations. Something has to be done. So there are some people that came up with uh, solutions. And that's where the whole debate and argument really is about how to adopt the solution. Remember, all of blockchain uh, is dependent on the currencies that float on it, the main currency being Bitcoin. And Bitcoin, in turn, is a, a people-driven thing. There is no one central authority that is able to dictate, saying, I command you to do such and such upgrade. You know, This is a mandatory order uh, coming from the CEO to say, everybody do this now. Have it completed by Friday. 9 a.m. or else you will face the consequences. There's no such authority. So we have to operate on a voluntary basis. And this is where the real discussion and the nervousness and the difficulty comes because human nature comes into play. Now, the solutions are very simple. You know, if you leave it as it is, carry on, no upgrade, you're going to have to face ever increasing uh, costs to make a simple single transfer. Now, imagine. You know, I know you would appreciate $50 worth of Bitcoin just nicely sitting there and hopefully being worth thousands of dollars in the years to come. That would be very nice. $50 became that. But then in your mind, you also know that for every $5 you've had to pay in fee for nothing, even those $5 would be worth at least a few hundred in the coming years. So why would you want to pay that out? You wanted, you know, the reason Bitcoin is, uh, was marketed uh, uh, earlier on uh, especially last year, was to say that it's practically zero transaction fee. So there's, there's just no way around. Now, the Bitcoin core team, the real Bitcoin people, the people who were in it before you and I uh, uh, took the plunge, they are known as segregated witness or SegWit. And they want to simply upgrade to improve the blockchain, and they want need to vote on it to keep the original Bitcoin. So improve the pipeline, uh, get rid of some of the gunk, you know, loosen some of the pipes a little bit, and let it flow, uh, uh, you know, and and you know, um, but keep basically everything else. The opposition is a guy called Roger Ver. He basically is the leader of uh, what this hard fork discussion really where it, where it comes from. You can actually pin it down to one person, but he's also got a few people behind him as well. But he is the public face of this rebellion that wants to have a different uh, Bitcoin called Bitcoin Unlimited. And that's why I've represented it by the red slushy color. That's why the blue and red slushies in, in the beginning. But you know, let's just go back there really quickly. Remember these two colors, red and uh, blue. As far as the miner is concerned, they can produce either or. OK, so the mining side is not even an issue. You want red? Okay, sure. Just turn the red tap on. We don't care. We are miners. So therefore, you and I shouldn't care. We are miners. You know. But our concern really is that we've already collected a few of these blue ones. What happens to them? What happens to their value? That's where our real concern really is. That's where the, that's where the money is stuck. So that's why we need to tackle this <clears throat> you know, with, a, with a little bit of clarity. Uh, and I hope I'm coming across to you. Uh, uh, in a reasonable way. Uh, uh, forgive me if, if this is all gobbledygook still, uh, but I'm hoping to uh, be able to simplify it as much as I can. Now, the hard fork is necessary for Bitcoin Unlimited, which means this software of the blue side will not even work. You need completely new software, which means all those taps and connections that choose to switch over to this side are going to lose their access to the blue side, and they're going to remain on the, black, on the red side. 
but they have to vote to actually come to the red side. In order to come to the red side, what's the difference anyway between the blue and the red? Well, the red guys are saying we want to have a pipeline twice as wide in diameter, not twice, four, maybe eight times wider in diameter. So we can shove a whole lot of slushy tra uh, traffic through there and it won't be a problem at all. <clears throat> but uh, that's all well and fine, uh, but uh, it will have a negative impact on the blue slushies that you are holding and I'm holding. Okay, it will. Because if this thing comes into play and it seems to be more attractive, people will start dumping the blue ones and buying the red one. So the red one coming into existence is bad news for all those people who hold small amounts of Bitcoin, which means a lot to them. If you hold so much Bitcoin that it doesn't mean anything to you, you've already made all the money you would ever needed to make in all your lifetime, then you couldn't care less if the little people suffered. And as long as you got to make more money using this red system, you wouldn't really care. So the blockchain would have to be changed. It could be a different blockchain. And it, you would have to dump BTC and get BTU. No doubt you could keep both of them. You could have one here and one here as well. You can have two separate wallets. Or the same wallet provider might provide you a wallet for one each, no problem, sometime in the future. But that is only if this red version even became viable. Now, Bitcoin really is a perfect currency. It is still not my money in my humble opinion. I know there are people who have very strong views on this and I don't really want to argue. But the reason it's not really money is because if the internet was to vanish because of some electromagnetic pulse coming from the sun or whatever, if any of that was to happen or if something happened to the internet, Bitcoin would be lost, not just for you and me, but for the whole world. And how would you operate, right? Gold would still be available. The only true money, in my humble opinion, is gold and silver. But Bitcoin is a perfect currency. It is far superior to everything that we have been used to when we handle paper notes and cash and other coins. Now, <clears throat> it has a number of advantages. I've only listed some of them here. It works on a blockchain, which is decentralized. So therefore, there's no one CEO or bank manager or governor that's going to dictate terms and conditions and make us do things because it is people oriented. It's distributed, which means it's not located in any one place. Nobody can come and shut it down. If somebody tried to switch off all the Bitcoin terminals and computers in, let's say, England, well, the French don't really care. They still have theirs. Bitcoin carries on. And you know, remotely, I could still have an account in France, couldn't I? Uh, if, if they shut my account down in the UK, for example. So it's distributed, and the, the importance is not just the geographical distribution of it. Uh, the fact that it is distributed uh, 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 is a hint towards its essential uh, socialist, uh, almost, uh, nature. It is not uh, uh, imperialist in nature like the banks usually are. It's accounted for. Uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to go through all of these points in detail, but basically it's also apolitical. Um, for example, a very, very simple example, uh, Bitcoin is perfectly legal and acceptable in a neutral country like Switzerland. Uh, it is legal and accepted as a commodity in a country like the United States, and it is legal and accepted as a commodity in Iran. So Iran accepts it, China accepts it, Korea accepts it, South Korea anyway, and the United States accepts it. You wouldn't normally expect these nations to accept something in common, and yet it is it is neutrally available to all of them. So it's apolitical, and it is actually counterfeit proof. Why? Because we just saw those thousands and thousands of nodes verifying each Bitcoin. There's no way you can slip in a fake Bitcoin. There's plenty of fake dollars around. On the other hand, uh, for the currency side of Bitcoin, uh, it does have scarcity value. There'll only ever be 21 million, but then because they are hugely divisible, uh, a part of that divisibility is also called, referred to as fungibility or reverse fungibility. There's a slight difference between the two, but 
I won't go into too much detail. But we, I don't want this to be a two-hour hangout uh, because you will actually get bored more than me. I can talk forever. Now, uh, it's also a store of value. Why? Because you know the difficulty rate that has been climbing constantly means that more power is needed to produce it, which means there's more money going in to even bring it out of its slushy machine. So if that is the situation, then it must have uh, a number of capital inputs that have gone in for Bitcoin to come out. And that means it is, uh, it's got intrinsic value. And it is a store of value simply because you know, um, even after all these scary discussions, it barely dropped below $1,800. Um, and it's come back up now. Uh, the last time I checked today, it was up uh, more than $2,200, $2,300, which is not, not bad. You know, so it, it does have a store of value. It's capped, um, which is again back to scarcity value, and the two are related. Uh, nobody can arbitrarily suddenly increase the supply from 21 to 22 million. Otherwise, it'll be like the US debt ceiling. You know, they went from 7 trillion to 10 trillion to 15 trillion to 17 trillion to 20 trillion. And uh, each time a ceiling arrives, they just uh, uh, remove the ceiling and increase it. Uh, basically, the debt of the United States is uncapped, whereas Bitcoin is capped just by its algorithm. It would crash otherwise. Um, and it's practical. It's highly, highly, highly portable. It actually can be transacted from your portable mobile phone. So it's, it's much more convenient than cash because regular cash, even if you had it stored somehow on your mobile phone, you would still need to go through an agent uh, uh, and if, if you had to make a bank transfer, it's still the same old boring, long-winded process. It's retailable. You can accept it uh, for no matter what product and services you have. If you uh, agree to accept it, uh, whether you're a hairdresser or a dog, mobile dog grooming service or whatever business you may have, it is actually uh, uh, readily uh, available for anybody to use in the retail space. Easily spendable, divisible, it's cross-border. Uh, basically, you can, you know, without physically crossing the Mexico-California border, <laughs> you, can, you can send Bitcoin across and nobody, nobody can stop you. And it's extremely fast, except for the congestion problem, right? I highly recommend this website, coin.dance. Uh, it's not coin. Instead of .com, it's .dance. Um, and they are a fantastic resource to check out various statistical numbers. Uh, do take some time to look at this website. The revolution will not be centralized. I've picked it up from them because they are so hardcore Bitcoin core that uh, you know they, they, they're the ones reporting uh, all this progress happening uh, in real time. And they're one of the best websites with comprehensive uh, graphs and charts, etc. So have a look, coin.dance. So really quickly, title a life cycle. This is a, a Scottish historian who put this life cycle together. And I just want to touch on this a little bit. Uh, uh, it may not be totally relevant, but it hopefully gives a, a, an idea of where we are at. So basically, you know, you could apply this to history as much as you could apply it to uh, religion. Uh, and you can apply it also to uh, various civilizations. This is a cycle that is proven more or less over and over. Uh, by the way, there is no fixed cutoff between two sides. Uh, so let's say from bondage going to faith, there is no fixed cutoff. So it could be any span of time, but the result is the same. So um, uh, you know, from the bondage of the Dark Ages of uh, Europe emerged the uh, early Puritans that needed to escape and seek uh, a religious freedom in a new world, and they moved to the new world which then was the United States and St. James's town was formed and Pennsylvania came along and everything else uh, happened and that was the beginning of the United States of America. But they had to escape Europe, the bondage of Europe, of Rome, of the Vatican, and set up camp where they didn't have to bow to the Pope. Uh, and that was basically a Protestant uh, thing. And along with them were the Jews who were driven out of uh, Spain in 1492 by Isabella and Ferdinand of Spain. They were given 24 hours to leave, and just that day, there happened to be some ships sailing towards the west, 
and a few Jews got on board. Uh, this history doesn't get discussed in mainstream media, unfortunately, but I have several books that make a lot of references to the original passengers and the original Pilgrim Fathers. Anyway, but if you say now that a point of no return in the banking system is what actually led during the credit crisis to the birth of Bitcoin, the logic is the same. If you need to, if you're stifled, frustrated, if you, if you can't, uh, you just cannot be yourself without the banks taking you for a ride and, you know, bail-ins and bailouts and all the nonsense that happened in the credit crisis. Out of that frustration came um, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto's idea, if that is his name, uh, the idea of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin was born, which you know is more or less like the Reformation that took place in Europe. What happens? The next stage is there is a greater growth in it, more courage. So when, in history terms, when the European settlers first moved to the New World, um, uh, they were actually benign people. They didn't go there killing natives straight away. Um, but they had to have courage to do this and the courage to form a nation. And hence, one of the greatest documents ever written is the United States original constitution because it reflects the mindset of the people that put a nation together, which is not an easy task uh, for many cultures put together. Now, uh, uh, in terms of Bitcoin, this is where the large investment comes in. It's born, it becomes accepted, and a lot of investment goes in. So hundreds and hundreds of millions already were invested in it, even before major governments began to accept it. Now, when major governments begin to accept Bitcoin, you have a sense of liberty about it, don't you? Right? When you hear news like Australia is putting tax laws around it and Korean government is doing something with Bitcoin and Japan has put it on the uh, basket of tradable currencies and Switzerland loves it. And when you hear all this, you have a sense of liberty around it. Now, that kind of historically equates to the Enlightenment period, you know, this uh, greater sense of euphoria about, oh, this is going really well. And then comes the abundance part, that the, you know, the productivity, uh, the Industrial Revolution that follows from the thinkers and the philosophers and the writers who creatively uh, inspire a nation. And the nation then goes ahead and builds greater things that they've never seen before and you've got the birth of the steam engine and everything else that would be beyond the uh, segregated witness discussion now because something has to happen for bitcoin to become um, after all the acceptances and after all the money gone in it still needs to get really really big time and that's where you and i hope to become millionaires literally with just a little bit of bitcoin you don't need hundreds of thousands just a few of them, and that could be a lot of money when this abundance comes. Now, when there is abundance, something happens. Some people get really selfish. They want even more. There's no break on the agreed, and that's when selfishness sets in. And that's where the Industrial Revolution led to corporate greed. That corporate greed basically was willing to employ child labor right here in England. Uh, there was zero holidays until the first company ever uh, was Cadbury's chocolate in, in uh, 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 Boneville in, uh, uh, near Birmingham. Cadbury's was the first company in the world to even introduce the idea of a paid day off, of a holiday. Uh, before that, everybody worked seven days a week, and there was absolutely no rest. Life was miserable. Children and even sick people were employed. That was the corporate greed. But a few companies came along, and they had to improve things, but not enough. But still, gradually, things improved. Then came the complacency. See, when most of the 150, 200-year-old companies uh, that you see, you know when you see a company that says established 1857 or established 1908 or whatever, when they existed, there was something uh, missing. Yeah? And what was missing was some, something very basic and simple called income tax. Income tax is just over a hundred years old. Did you know that? It is not something everybody's paid all the time. The taxes that were collected before that by the sort of monarchy and, and the sort of uh, 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 kings, etc., were all basically percentages of produce rather than uh, uh, 
you know, income as such. So anyway, uh, I hope this is making sense. But this guy, Roger Ver, is already here. He's well beyond abundance. And that was the point I really wanted to make. So I went about it in a long-winded way slightly. But basically, you know, I'm too busy when people say, look, I'm, I don't really care. They can take taxes as long as I've got a job. That's complacency. Then comes, you know, the distraction of uh, Disneyland and Hollywood and entertainment. And right under your nose, the fractional reserve system is introduced, and most people don't even realize or understand what it is. Then comes uh, a sense of uh, apathy and dependence where you've got the gold standard removed. Money is really worthless. Banks need bailout. Overregulation kills industry. And uh, greed, again, which has still survived, makes the jobs outsourced to a cheaper location instead of bringing slaves from somewhere else and making them grow crops on your soil. Why not just outsource it, let the slaves remain where they are, which is basically what the uh, poor, uh, uh, low paid, wa low wage workers really represent. And they're slaves somewhere else, but they still feed a system somewhere else. So I hope this kind of makes sense, but this is why Roger is uh, uh, way ahead. He's the traitor of Bitcoin. He was an early investor, right? Some rumor that he has 300,000 Bitcoin, which at today's $2,500 price makes him worth $750 million. And now I don't know if it's true or not. It's a rumor. You can look it up. Even if he has half that, you know, four or $500 million is not bad, is it? Because he got in really early. But, you know, if Bitcoin, forget million per Bitcoin, if it just reached $100,000 and if he truly has 300,000, that makes him worth $100 billion. $100 billion is basically Bill Gates and Warren Buffett combined, more or less, the top two richest people combined, and he'll be richer than them. So is there a greed here or not? Why does he, he's already got a shed load of Bitcoin. Why does he already want to have greater flow happening? And when that flow happens, something's going to happen. And this is one of the reasons why this company here, Coindance, uh, it says the revolution will not be centralized. What does that mean? Well, if Bitcoin Unlimited comes along, that's the red nasty one, then these guys, him and his friends, will have greater control on it. And it will be more centralized towards them than the current Bitcoin, which is totally and completely decentralized. There are groups of people that operate, you know, uh, like like a, a mob, uh, even in Bitcoin core. But as far as Bitcoin Unlimited is concerned, it will be confirmed who the mob really is, right? And that would be this guy. Now, I've just picked up a few random words here from websites. He's, he used to be called uh, Bitcoin Jesus, and people are now calling him Bitcoin Judas, because he already tried to hard fork once by aligning with another type of Bitcoin called Bitcoin XT. That didn't work. He fell flat on his face. But he's so shameless, he doesn't get embarrassed. He's been to jail and everything for selling fireworks on eBay. So he's not really exactly a role model. It's not the type of person you want uh, necessarily to be a role model to anybody. Yes, lots of money. But look what he's doing to everybody, including you and me. Yeah, so that, that's where you evaluate the quality and caliber of a person, not at the numbers, what he has in his wallet. Um, slimy lizard, not to be trusted, right? Somebody said here, still, I don't understand why he didn't advocate Segwit uh, with the same fervor as increasing the block size, because he's a vain, selfish, whatever. Um, so there are lots of you know, opinions about him out there. These are not my opinions, but... I wanted to show you why this discussion is even getting to this point. Because if there was no um, threat to uh, uh, Bitcoin from uh, the, the unlimited side uh, or any version of it, they may rename themselves and call themselves something else. Doesn't really matter. They may try and do a stealth attack in a different way. Doesn't really matter. Uh, but the point is that why are they so hell-bent on having a hard fork when a soft fork will do nicely for a while and then the problem will persist and we'll need yet another soft fork at some point in the future. But a series of soft forks are fine. Uh, scalability is an issue. There's a, there is an issue. 
but there are ways to fix it over a period of time. If you don't have the solution right now, why do you want to damage uh, uh, the journey that Bitcoin has had uh, uh, already? Why would you want to completely damage it? Right? So it's not as dire as they make it out to be. It, there are solutions available, and that's why segregated witness even exists, right? Bitcoin's soul is decentralization, not private organization. Bitcoin is a community oriented. Uh, do you really think you're smarter than Satoshi Nakamoto because he did not set up Satoshi and Son? Bitcoin's success is due to its universality, universality and open mindedness. You're really not working on the right coin, Mr. Ver. Right. Another comment here, he told the crowd, I'm willing to bet any amount that segregated witness will not activate. Guess what? <laughs> it is going to activate. We've already very nearly reached the percentage needed for it to be kind of sealed. So he's wrong. Would you like to take me up on that? Thousand, ten thousand, a gentleman's bet? Well, get lost. And another person here said, who would be crazy enough to give governance to him? to a buggy, unsecure code, because unlimited is unsecure, unrealistic, unwanted by users and exchanges. I wish the community will make the right choice. 93% of the nodes are pro-segregated witness. Listen to the users. <clears throat> so as far as you're concerned, what, what really happened over the last few days? I mean, last few weeks, a uh, couple of weeks anyway, there was an upsurge in private messages to me as well about, you know, what do you think is happening? I'm nervous and, excuse me, just wet my uh, whistle a little bit. Um, you know, I'm nervous and, uh, you know, what's going on? Uh, can you tell me this? Can you tell me that? And, you know, there's a lot of messages. I do apologize if I haven't replied to you, but there's a, the, the nervousness in the market, the concerns about what's been going on have caused an unnecessary uh, volume increase in communication uh, that really needn't be there, to be honest with you. And I'll ex try and explain that now. When Bitcoin reached about $3,000, that's on the 11th of June or thereabouts, it went down 30% till about the 11th of July, right? It went from 3,000 to this level here, uh, about 30% drop. So that itself is not really good news for those who are mining because they would have seen some kind of a drop in their daily returns and rewards. And especially when it took a sharp nosedive like here and like here, uh, there would have been a sharp decrease two or three days later because there's a lagging effect to mining. It isn't 24 hours. 24 hours is when you start getting your first payment the moment you start, but there is a uh, progressive uh, rationale. This is why some payments are usually delayed more than 24 hours. So what happens here may reflect on your daily payments two or three days later, if not the next day. Okay. So and then if when it shoots back up, the improved payment uh, may show a lag of again one, two, or three days even. Uh, and that is normal. It's nothing to panic or worry about. But with this kind of drop, obviously, there was already a lot of nervousness building up. And then again, it dropped. Boom. And at this point, there was a major surge in social media comments by people saying, oh, Bitcoin is dying. And all kinds of people saying, you're right, bro. I should have sold it, bro. And all these bro and bro and pie and pie everywhere. And, I'm sorry, guys, but you know, if everybody was an expert uh, at, at all this, uh, you know, they would have all spent some time in a proper trading floor, surely, right? Just learning a bit of FX uh, from a computer somewhere in you know, some backwater somewhere. That doesn't make anybody an expert. No doubt you can learn and become proficient in what you do, but uh, you know, traders don't panic like this. It's only when really markets go bad, that's when I've, you know, on the trading floor, I've seen people throw phones and telephone books at each other and all that. <coughs> but realistically, what happens on, on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, and so on, is the problem is made much worse 
your nervousness is increased by people who don't really necessarily know what they're reporting. They're just spreading fear for no reason, and it is not right. This printout up here is from today. Segregated witness. This whole green bar you see are the people who have already committed support. Uh, the blue bar are people who are already prepared and ready for the soft fork upgrade. Okay, very few opposing. 86%, it only needs four more percent, and boom, we're in there. And out of this, uh, the chances of the red increasing are very low. So we are almost there, and looks like segregated will go ahead. And basically, the version which activates uh, the segwit is uh, uh, still in discussion. But that you know, we don't need to get into that detail. Like you can discuss each of these separately. But the point simply is that you have now understood that the Bitcoin core community backs Bitcoin core and does not like the idea of a hard fork. They do not want a hard fork because they also are dependent on Bitcoin's continued success for its uh, 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 and its, its price to continue in a positive way. So last week, in just two days actually, this week in fact, 13th of July, it took a massive 30% nose dive till the 16th of July, 30th to 16th July. And then from the 16th of July, uh, Bill, Bill, are you there? I think you've unmuted yourself. You just hear some noise, that's all. Thanks. Um, so um, yeah, 30% drop, and then two days later, 30% increase. Two days on 19th of July, it's hovering around here, around 2,300 and something, 400 level. Yeah. Now, what I wanted to show here is that when it dropped this much over the last few days, uh, between these two dates, um, your mining was still returning roughly 72% per annum. Y yes, I appreciate a lot of people were concerned that I was earning $14 before and now I'm earning less than 10. Yes, there's a number of factors that play in, but even the 10 that you're actually earning is still several times higher than what your bank is able to do for you. <coughs> Excuse me. And then within two days when it shot up again, the reading was 89% roughly annualized. Now obviously, the annual figures count for nothing. They're just a reference point because we don't know where the difficulty rate will be two months from now. So there's no point in talking about an annualized rate. But the reason it's put in this way is because so you have a reference point as to the return potential. So the return potential of 72% down here jumped up to about 89% in just two days, right? So why panic when we know that there are the right people behind the bulk of Bitcoin's infrastructure? They are not uh, supporting this traitor because they don't want Bitcoin to fail. He wants Bitcoin to fail so he can have a new Bitcoin where he has more control. So the majority consensus is, is with the people, we the people. This is truly people power in play. But what happened here is another nasty little thing, which is basically the signal uh, for the uh, Bitcoin Improvement Plan 91. It came around the 16th of July. There's no reason for that signal to come 16th of July. And it could have come 11th of July even, or 13th of July. So basically, those who signaled with that improvement plan, which will then kickstart uh, either that or the other will kickstart SegWit, that improvement plan was signaled here for the first time saying, hey, we're going to do this proposal, and we're going to support segregated witness. And that's when it started moving in the positive territory again. right? But there's no reason for them to have done it here rather than here, except even they might have thought, well, you know, let the fear continue. Let's sell now. When it drops a little more, then we'll pick up more cheaply. So even the segregated witness side aren't necessarily all angels. Uh, they're also humans. Um, and you know they also may operate in some kind of small mob mentality. But at least on the... Uh, uh, broad perspective, they are the right people, and they are the ones we want to support, to be honest, because <clears throat> the scalability option is discussion is going to be an ongoing issue, but 
it should the hard fork discussion and coin splitting should not really destroy or interfere with bitcoin's true potential and it doesn't have to be that way <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> so here's a quote from john mcafee on twitter very recently i've got a doctorate in point set topology to me that's maths and it predicts bitcoin at two million four hundred thirty one thousand and thirteen dollars per coin in three years other math systems between 1.9 million and 2.6 million per bitcoin in three years now either he's being overconfident or he's just doing what he does for a phd in uh, topology um, you know he's just telling you look according to my numbers this is where it, where, where it's at so guys get yourself some bitcoin and do the mining but you know in all of this dropping of the coins uh, value and also in the perceived uh, uh, destruction of the profitability of mining came a lot of fear and a lot of questions so i just wanted to clarify this why is my payout decreasing this is literally copy pasted from the genesis mining website and they tell you very clearly we do not control the evolution we cannot control the payouts the payouts are controlled by the algorithm the difficulty rate no single miner has control on it and i'll like, cover that in a short moment but uh, nobody has control over the profitability of bitcoin mining on top of that, it's important to note, again from the Genesis website, is that they will charge 0 0.00028 per gigahash per second per day. Okay, This will not change whether Bitcoin is uh, profitable to you by 100% or 1,000%. Every extra bit of profit that comes as a result of the Bitcoin price is yours to keep. They're only charging a fixed maintenance fee. They could have charged a percentage basis, right? So if you made 100, they would take 10. If you made 1,000, they would take 100. If you made 10,000, they would take 1,000. They could have done that. They could have followed the price of Bitcoin and taken a percentage basis. But no, they're keeping it flat. And this is very, very important because this is how you know how just how critical it is to be with a company that enables you to make a fortune just by partnering with them through Swiss Gold Global, of course. But the point is, your overheads are fixed. The difficulty will keep varying. The profitability will keep varying. But really, there has never been any time to worry or panic whatsoever, in my view, anyway. <clears throat> Now, <coughs> excuse me. When this uh, segregated witness happens, or if something changes drastically, or something goes wrong, what are you supposed to do? What what are your options? Excuse me. What are you supposed to do with your coins? I mean, are they safe? What do you do with them? So here are some options for everybody in the world. Get a hard wallet, and especially if you are in our chat group. If you're not in our chat group, and yet you are a member of our Swiss Gold Global team, or any Swiss Gold Global team anywhere in the world, if you would like to stay in touch with some very friendly, enthusiastic people who keep informing each other about constant developments and things that are happening, and you know, the, the team that is actively chatting away in the group, they already have discussed and covered all of this. So in a way, my presentation to you today is kind of futile because they are already way ahead of it. You know, I haven't had a chance to comment myself yet because I've been so busy reading what people are saying. You know, uh, you, you, uh, hundreds of messages in a day pile up, and a lot of content is shared. A lot of people who raise questions are usually helped uh, whatever we can but you know get a hard wallet is one solution for everybody else trezor and ledger are the popular ones there may be two or three others but these are the current ones that are a hard wallet you, you put your
Bitcoin loaded into a little stick device plugged into the side of your computer. When the Bitcoin is loaded in there, pull it out, and now your Bitcoin is in that little stick instead of your computer or anywhere else. Spread out to altcoins. Well, if you're panicking about Bitcoin crashing yet again, go to Ethereum, Litecoin, Dashcoin, buy a different coin. The trouble is usually when Bitcoin is down, all others are also down. So they are really closely correlated. But if you wanted to spread your risk away from Bitcoin, that is when you take this option. You could simply sell it for cash. If you thought, okay, this is getting nervous again, and this is not really ideal right now, um, I want to, you know, um, I think I think it'll, it'll crash. If you feel that and it is going down, instead of waiting on it and panicked, uh, panicking yourself and hoping it'll come up the next day, but seeing it even further down, well, you know, if you're really nervous and if you think your dollars are better with you, then just you know sell and wait and then buy back. Except I'm not going to tell you when to buy back because. For that, you have to be <laughs> trading-minded to actually monitor the real lows, and I'm not going to do that myself. Uh, so then you're pretty much on your own. You'll end up asking other people who may actually end up misguiding you, but that's your choice. But that's one thing you can do. Get your dollars out. Yeah. Get paper keys. You can actually print your Bitcoin, the code, the keys of your uh, uh, Bitcoin, out on a piece of paper, and now your Bitcoin is on paper. It's not existing anywhere else except on paper because ultimately it's just a code. Or you can download a wallet. Some downloadable wallets include Exodus and Electrum. Um, these are wallets that uh, you can literally download onto your computer. So they're like your Coinbase or whatever, uh, but instead of being held with someone else, they're actually being held on your computer. So it's your, then it's entirely your problem. You can get an online wallet that is ready for a change. So Coinbase, for example, that's why it's in red. Coinbase is not ready. Um, they haven't signaled uh, either way. I don't think they have yet anyway. But Wirex has. Wirex says, you know, if, if uh, Unlimited comes along, we'll be ready for it. But if Core, is, uh, core stays, we're ready for that too. So, you know, you, you just find out which online wallet is doing what, and accordingly, you get into the right wallet because it'll take you a few days to set it up correctly if they ask for verifications and all that. Usually, it's much faster than that, but if it takes time, you know. And if you don't know what else to do with your Bitcoin, well, spend it on mining because it's going to give you a return. Do not spend it on any trading program without proof of trading, but spend it on mining by all means. But you know what? This is for everyone else. We can do all of this, but we have one additional option. And this is very, very important. And this is incredibly critical to recognize what this is. You see, you haven't missed this chart, have you? I hope you haven't overlooked the significance of this chart. 30% down here, another few percent down here, like you know, 45% down in one month, just over a month. That doesn't look good on any commodity. And that's when all the critics come in, they start booing you, right? <clears throat> so what can you do? Here is what you can do. That's a 40% drop in a month. If you had $1,000 in Bitcoin, you suddenly have 600 remaining showing in your wallet. Not very good, is it? It's a 40% drop. But if around here, when getting nervous with the first time it crashed and came back up and you thought it might crash again, if you wanted to, if you had moved that into gold, and this is, this is what we do, this is why we exist. And I don't want to say that you should do this every time there's a panic in the market. No, not at all. But you should do it with some of your Bitcoin. You must do this just to preserve an asset that doesn't fluctuate so much. Because in the exact same period of time, 11th of June, I'm using a British pound sterling price for gold here simply because a thousand pound is you know, gives you a good idea of the percentage drop, and it's only a six percent drop from thousand pound to nine hundred and forty pound, so roughly about twelve hundred and something to about <clears throat> uh, eleven hundred and something in dollars, right? <clears throat> so a thousand pound dollars in gold would leave you still with nine hundred and forty preserved over the same period of time. And when you're ready, 
to buy back if you think it's going to go up again and it should when you are able to read the data coming out on websites like coin.dance when you get to that level of understanding that you realize that okay this is good news for bitcoin so therefore it should be turning and it should be going up now i think now is a good time to get into bitcoin if you learned to read that a little bit that is the time you're able to sell back your gold at 0% mission and get back into bitcoin if you so choose obviously there are transaction costs here and there but you know uh, without those transaction costs no business will be profitable anyway so as far as your mining contracts are concerned, if a hard fork happens, Genesis have confirmed that they will switch to the dominant coin. They couldn't care less. Actually, they do care. They are on the blue side. They are on the blue uh, uh, Bitcoin uh, core side, and they don't like uh, the Bitcoin red side, Okay, the, the unlimited side. They don't. But if that's what the majority says, they're like, yeah, okay, well, if that's what the public wants, you know, if that's what people want, they'll switch. You know, they are the, the slushy makers. Remember, I showed you that picture with the red and the blue slushy machine, right? They, they have both ability. So it doesn't matter to them. So, you know, if they're going to switch to the dominant one, whatever the dominant one is, if a hard fork happens, you are in the right place, right? Surely. But to know, that this giant player in the market actually has the priority right in supporting the original conceptual idea of Bitcoin itself, you should know that this is a good company that will do what is right for Bitcoin itself per se because they're built on Bitcoin. They cannot take an ax and chop their own feet off. Uh, that would be too foolish for a company with a $100, $200 million balance sheet. Now, they support core integrity, which is what I just mentioned, of the Bitcoin community. So you don't have to worry about uh, uh, where your priority lies. But if necessary, they will switch. We don't know. Nobody knows right now. But if, if the time comes, you don't have to worry by being a member of the mining operation. Now, they will maintain a fixed fee. And any excess is yours. This is what I was trying to tell you. It's why it's so important to realize that. So somebody, uh, not somebody, a few people actually asked me, my payments are less just because Bitcoin is going down. Has Genesis decided to take more money from me? No. The fee is fixed. The reason you're getting less is because of the way in which mining operates. If the price of Bitcoin is down, your mining rewards are lower. If the difficulty is high, regardless of the price, your mining payout is lower. So those two things come, in, come into play. Cisco Global will not interfere in your daily or periodic payout. So when the back office shows uh, you know, pending payment, pending payment, it's not Swiss Gold Global holding it back. Swiss Gold Global cannot hold it back. So all Swiss Gold Global has done is got a little code that connects to the Genesis system, and it reads the same data and displays it to you in your back office. That's all it does. Swiss Gold Global is not a Bitcoin wallet. They cannot hold any coin. They must. It, they don't even pay it out to you. It's actually Genesis that pays it out to you straight away into your wallet. It is reflected as a mirror image in the back office. And that's all it is. So there's no interference on Cisco Global. Your payments don't go up or down because of SGG. Um, and do, you, your contract is not with Cisco Global anyway. So there's no question of SGG trying to take more or keep more or whatever. It's just absolutely not even a discussion because they are just an agency that forwards a fantastic service to you. And because they have an agreement with the supplier, they say, okay, look, if your people bring more to us, we'll give you a fatter bonus. That's how you earn 5% on every single contract that is purchased through Swiss Gold Global instead of two and a half on Genesis's own website. Genesis does have higher pay scales for bigger packages sold directly on Genesis. Yes, they do. Um, but uh, we have advantages that they don't. Genesis can't offer you gold and silver at wholesale prices as a safe haven. 
one of the reasons, by the way, I wanted to show you this also is that this, if, if this happens with Bitcoin, and you have the ability to put it into something that doesn't really budge much, 6% is not a big deal over a month, is it really? 6% up, 6% down in a month. It's not a big deal. It's nothing like 40%. So if this happens with any other product, service, or commodity, or any kind of uh, securitized investment, guess where that money ought to be? Ought to be. Not that people are going to do it, but it should be in a relative safe uh, defensive asset such as uh, uh, gold. But you're then able to take the system and share it with people and tell them, look, we have this unique ability. Nobody else currently offers this, and we do. Now, Cisco Global do not penalize you in case of lapsed memberships. A lot of people keep asking me, saying, uh, oh, I couldn't pay my membership fee. Does that mean my mining payment will stop? No, it won't. You are contracted with Genesis. So if you're due a payment, Genesis will pay you directly. You only need to log into Cisco Global to see when, at what time you got paid, uh, or how much you're being owed. And if it is too little, and if those transaction fees are so fat that it's just not worth sending your payment to you, then yes, of course, it'll be held back. It'll be held back two days, three days, four days, five days. So if it's a small $30 contract, uh, the daily production is so small, it may be held back seven, eight, nine, ten days, or 14 days before it is paid out to you. I mean, if you put in $30, how much really were you expecting to make over a year through genuine mining? There are other systems that pay more, but then again, you know, they, they don't prove to you how they make their money, so it could be a Ponzi scheme very easily, more likely it is. But here it's genuine mining, and the payment is in direct uh, 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 relation to uh, uh, the, the amount of money you put in in the first place. So SGG do not penalize you, and you're not contracting for mining with SGG. You're going through SGG and contracting with Genesis, and just to make that a little clear. So this is something uh, I've been wanting to cover for a while, actually. Way, way back, 2009, when Bitcoin was born, we'll call it era one, the first era of Bitcoin mining. There were 50 Bitcoins per block being mined. And that's uh, just under four year span of time that that was the most profitable thing. You could just spend a few hundred dollars and you'd be making tens and tens and hundreds of Bitcoin per day. That's how much Bitcoin was being spat out. Look at this blue line, it's practically flat on the floor. It's just stuck to the ground level all the way up to maybe January 14 when it begins to pick up a little bit. Right? In the second era, and then the halving event took place. Even after the halving, it was still incredibly profitable. If you knew what you were doing way, way back then, which clearly most of us didn't, otherwise we wouldn't be doing this business. We'd be you know, touring the world like Roger Ver and you know, trying to rally support <laughs> for Bitcoin Unlimited. Um, Maybe not all of us, I wouldn't, but you get the point. Uh, you know, the second halving uh, event happened around here, which is middle of uh, uh, 2016. And that began the third era of Bitcoin. We are right now in the third era of Bitcoin. The fourth era of Bitcoin will begin in 1,065 days. In the first era, 50 Bitcoin per block, then 25, then half to 12 and a half. In June, 2020, in 1,065 days from today, the 19th of July, 2017, Bitcoin blocks will be halved. But what happened here is this difficulty rate only started picking up because of the number of new miners joining the platform. And it came to a point where it began to suddenly shoot up like this. And this is the graph of Bitcoin difficulty rate right now. This blue line up here is the difficulty rate right now. This is the all-time difficulty chart. Okay, you can look it up yourself. Coin.dance has a nice chart as well. But when uh, Cisco Global added mining, we were telling people, you can get about 50, 55% per year. And people were like, yeah, well, not really interesting, is it? Yeah. But at that point, the Bitcoin uh, difficulty was around this level. 
he was returning 55%. Then difficulty shot up to this level around April, it was returning around 70%. Then now in July, it's in the region of 90%. So <clears throat> when people say, oh, difficulty rate going up makes it less profitable every day, it appears like that, but the fractions you're getting are worth that much more. Remember, Bitcoin here was just a few dollars, and the difficulty rate didn't matter. But the difficulty rate going up hasn't made mining less profitable all of a sudden. It's made it more profitable. Look at the numbers, and you can work these out yourself. And those of us uh, that have been members uh, uh, since before November 2016, we know when the first mining packages were launched, we worked it out, 50, 55%. We were like, yeah, okay, we're happy with this. You know, it might take close to just over uh, a year and a bit by compounding to actually overcome the or recover your initial capital, etc. We were discussing that. And then in April, we were saying, oh, wow, look, it's 70. You know, the, the price has really gone up and you know, it's more than 2,000. And some miracles happened around December, January. And you know, Bitcoin really made it really big splash and capture everybody's attention. Now, <clears throat> to wrap this up, Bitcoin depends on the community. Its integrity is tied to the community. And the community includes miners, those who operate wallets, which are not necessarily exchanges. Then there are the exchanges, which are mainly exchanges, but not necessarily wallets, but you can still hold your Bitcoin in an exchange. And then there are the nodes and the developers. The, the nodes are actually the same as uh, uh, you and me, but with an added function of uh, being uh, involved in the actual governance of Bitcoin by being involved in the voting process, etc. You can become one if you want to. I, I have no interest, and I know most people don't. You don't want to get too technical with this. But <coughs> oh, excuse me. But the miners are the ones that have spent the most capital, hundreds of millions of dollars collectively into the life and the soul of Bitcoin. The wallets and exchanges exist because Bitcoin pays them their commission. So they want Bitcoin to go up in price, to be valuable. They hate the idea of losing because the whole business model is based on transactional charges and making money or making Bitcoin. And the more Bitcoin fractions they get, the more money they make. So it stands to reason they, they're not against us. They're not in favor of a split. <clears throat> now, the, the developers and the entire human uh, team of brains behind Bitcoin are all volunteers. Nobody pays them a salary. That's why it's decentralized. Um, a lot of them have developed peripheral little websites that do very nice information things and blogs and forums and everything else. But they have absolutely no interest in seeing Bitcoin fail. So when all the main components of the Bitcoin community, the miners, the wallets, the exchanges, and the developers all put together need Bitcoin to succeed, in order for them to maintain the uh, uh, usefulness of their capital, the return on their original capital, the income that comes through the commission, and the fact that they're volunteers basically means that their income uh, uh, to a large degree and their fortunes depend on Bitcoin. None of these people wanted to split. There are a few greedy ones that will bend and try and do things but guys listen when bitcoin mining has gone profitable from 55 to 90 percent in the same time that you've seen the steepest rise in bitcoin difficulty rate i don't think we need to worry at all why are you worried in fact you have a thousand and sixty five days to make the most of the mining power you have now after the june 2020 split overnight your mining power will be halved so basically if you had one terahash of mining power 
suddenly you're going to need two terahash overnight to produce the same result as yesterday. But that's all it means. These are step increases. Why? Why do you have these step in? Why this difficulty rate? That is to prevent, look, there are nations on earth that do nothing, manufacture nothing, produce nothing, and you've got a whole millions of uh, people sitting around twiddling thumbs, and you throw a few, you know, uh, uh, wrongly funded dollars at them. If they each started mining randomly on their own computer, there'd be no value to Bitcoin. It'd be as worthless as sand. So the difficulty rate ensures that Bitcoin has an intrinsic value, and therefore the difficulty rate is our friend. And you need to grasp this idea, I believe, in order to appreciate difficulties on our side. Difficulty increasing is not a bad thing because by difficulty increasing, it automatically pushes the price up. We only want to see that the price keeps jumping and staying way ahead of the difficulty rate and doesn't drop back, that's the catch. It doesn't drop back below a certain level, which right now I believe is just over $700 per Bitcoin. I really don't see Bitcoin at $700 unless Roger Ver type of people you know, force its destruction for their own personal gain. I mean, he's already got enough money. Why he's doing all this, nobody really knows except you know, he's got really serious integrity issues. He can cry all the crocodile tears on TV about you know the politics of banking and everything else. All that is fine. What he's doing to the large community of miners, of nodes and developers, etc., it's just unfair, I believe. So don't panic. My favorite movie, Tombstone, Doc Holliday, played by Val Kilmer, and he says, you're daisy if you do. So I'd like to end my presentation today. Uh, there is a second part to this, but too much content, I believe, would probably make you cringe. So I'm going to stop sharing and just check with my friend Bill Wilmot. Was it okay? And uh, do we have any comments or any concerns or anything? Yeah, hi, hi. It, it was fantastic, actually. Um, I think it's um, addressed a lot of questions that people would have. Um, there's quite a few comments in in the uh, chat room, and a few questions as well. Um, so if you've got time, I'd like to try and address some of those questions, yeah? Now, Scott um, did have a question, Scott Lang, uh, which I think he's happy you've addressed the question he had, but let me just have a quick look and I'll read them out. One second. It's just scrolling up. So from Judy Tucker, if soft fork Sedgwick occurs, does it occur automatically without the miner or the holder of the coin having to do anything? Thoughts on wallets you've discussed already, but she particularly says thoughts on the wallets where the Bitcoin holder doesn't have the keys. Okay, so the, uh, Judy, this is what uh, has actually been discussed quite a lot in the Telegram group as well as the other chat group. Uh, so to be very clear about this, you have nothing to do except to make sure that your coin uh, wallet, whatever that is, signals saying we are ready. We are ready for the SegWit soft fork update. Yeah, uh, Because that is the way it is going right now, uh, percentage terms. So we don't have to worry about the hard fork right now. But the hard fork discussion will come up again November the 1st or thereabouts, uh, this problem isn't going to go away. This greed issue isn't going to go, go away. Neither is the scalability hurdle that Bitcoin automatically has isn't going to go away. But one of the updates right now is integrating, or the proposal is to integrate, and that's why you've got so many different little proposals. One of them, they want to integrate the Lightning Network, which is what Litecoin uses. So if you have Litecoin, sell it, because it will go down because of that reason. So when Lightning is implemented, Litecoin becomes irrelevant and Bitcoin takes uh, its place and speedily transfers, right? But as far as your wallet and your keys are concerned, don't worry about it. Your wallet isn't going to disappear. Just don't do any transactions. And if you're expecting money coming in, you know, you still have a few days. Uh, in my case, I set up two extra accounts. I've got myself two separate ATM cards, both of which are ready. 
Yeah. So um, uh, Wirex, for example, is a one I mentioned earlier in the presentation. Um, just a few days, two or three days before this takes this activation takes place, I'm going to take my Wirex card address and stick it into the back office so that I know from which period of time the daily payments are going into my Wirex card. If anything goes wrong, it's only a little bit. But my main holding remains in my main wallet. Yeah? And you don't have to worry or panic about it anymore. Go to coin.dance. There's a whole bunch of statistics there. You can see live updates. And when people are reporting the consensus is now at 86%, 87%, whatever, where are they getting that information from? It's already available. So I hope that answers your question. You don't need to get all technical about it and worry about you know, having private keys, etc. Yes, if you wanted private keys, there is a way. Google it. You'll find out how to print your Bitcoin. Even if it's a fraction, it doesn't have to be hundreds and hundreds of dollars. You know, even if it's a few dollars worth, you can actually take that and stick it onto a little barcode and print it off the printer. Now you have it in a piece of paper and you've got it printed down. Just make sure you don't burn it, right? But you can have that. It's printed off, and now you don't need keys, and it's not with any other wallet. So there's a, there are many ways of doing this, but you know, it's your choice. But we can cover this again if you want, um, if necessary. But any other questions, Bill? Uh, yes, just uh, one, one more here, actually. For Michelle Carter, does each currency have its own blockchain? Um, blockchain can handle multiple currencies, uh, but each of the currencies has its own uh, uh, way of transmitting. So, for example, if you had a uh, Ethereum, its uh, uh, chain is different from uh, Bitcoin. It has no cross wires there. And that's why there are multiple chains and there, uh, there are different proposals. That's why Lightning is used for Light Litecoin, for example, and wasn't being used for Bitcoin so far. Uh, that's simply a function of uh, 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 being a different uh, uh, chain. But yes, in theory, all uh, uh, one blockchain can handle, <clears throat> is meant to handle multiple functions at the same time. Uh, but different coins do actually have different chains, yes. That's my my understanding. I could be completely wrong and somebody <laughs> shoots me in the head and says, you idiot. But, you know, <laughs> that's that's as far as my knowledge goes. Okay, thanks, Prem. I mean, I have to say we have some very good comments today. I think it's a very enjoyable session. I think it's um, answered a lot of questions that people had. And um, we actually had a thumbs down as well on YouTube. So... Steve Lawson's put this out, and obviously, um, a bit surprised by that, but because the value is coming through his is free, it's educational, and anyone who's in the crypto world should be taking interest in the subject matter we have. So, don't we understand the uh, what's behind that? But anyway, um, we've got a chap called Derek Melander who's asking where the, how can you find the link to your discussion group, which I think he must be in the Facebook group. Okay, so. Um we have a Facebook group, which you will find on this YouTube channel. If you look at the various options, there's a Facebook group link already there, uh, and you can join us there. <clears throat> if you um, are not a member yet, um, why don't you join the group? There's a number of people active in the group, and if any of them are common friends, then that would be an ideal way for you to connect with a common friend and uh, ask them for a link if you wanted to join our opportunity. Uh, but other than that, um, you know, uh, comment after this video is over. Uh, in about 10 minutes later, when the video is actually live, uh, you're able to comment in the section below. When you do that, I'll uh, uh, show you where the group is. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So I think uh, we'll probably leave it there. It's been oh, sorry, it's quarter to 11 almost. <laughs> it's been a. You know, it doesn't feel like it's been a long, long one actually. So obviously, it's gone down well. So. Um, I guess we'll call it a night and wish everyone well. Yes, thank you, everybody, and thanks for uh, your patience. Sorry, it took so long. I, I, there was a lot more content, to be honest. I literally removed 20 other pages to cut it down. Wow. So next time we can do more. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot more to discuss because uh, blockchain itself has so many different functions uh, that if you're aware of what it is capable of, I would also like to discuss some other coins because I think there is some very, very nice potential 
uh, from from other coins. One of them hasn't launched yet, but it has got a payment system that is actually quite ingenious. Das Pay, you know, uh, when that materializes, I think it's going to be revolutionary. I'm personally not involved in the uh, uh, opportunity side because uh, it, my time I have had to dedicate to one thing focused. Uh, but there are no number of people involved with it. And if it takes off, when it takes off, I think that should be very interesting. And I think we need to discuss these things and you know bring it out in the open to say, mm -hmm. look, this could be a game changer. Uh, it may be worth putting something in there passively. But on the other hand, there are other coins that need to be discussed. And I believe they need to be exposed for what they are. Uh, simply because you know when somebody says our value keeps going up no matter what look Bitcoin is going up and down We just keep going up and they then they can't explain where that value is coming from When nobody can actually buy it on any open exchange Where does the value of that coin actually come from other than being a Ponzi scheme? So you know there are pros and cons to a number of systems and I think if this can be discussed openly without Me being called a hater or anything then you know we need to have an adult conversation about this and I think this would give value to you and your audience, and you can take this uh, uh, video, download it, rip it, do whatever you want, and share it anyhow you like. If it is value, and if it is useful to you, we can have a lot more of these going on. Yeah. So thanks again for being here, and uh, we'll catch up soon. Great. Cheers, Prem. Bye bye.